As I said, uh, I can't be on campus this week. Uh, I'm still here in Europe. Right now, I am actually in Munich, uh, visiting Thomas Neumann at, at TUM. Um, that's where they invented Hyper and the new data system they've been putting in Umbra. So part of me going down to visit Thomas is sort of to sort of get a better understanding of why the Germans are so good at databases. And so as part of this, they took me up here in the Alps, somewhere in the mountains. I don't know exactly where we are. It's freezing. And the idea, it's like this, you go in the woods and you think about your thoughts for like an hour or something. Somehow that's going to magically make you uh, better understand databases. So whatever. I'm just sitting here now. It's freezing cold. There's some hunting dog running around fighting things. You may see that in the background. Um, and I thought it'd be a good time to get through and start discussing uh, the next lecture. So we'll see how far we can get before it gets too cold. So the last class, we discussed the sort of a high level history of database systems. And primarily what I focused on was sort of thinking about the problem uh, in, in terms of like at a high level, mostly based on data models, you know, whether it was the codicil stuff or the, the hierarchical data model, the relational data model. Um, and so that was the sort of the main discussion of last class. Another way to sort of think about it was an overarching theme throughout the entire history of databases is this constant struggle of building database systems that have to deal with the limitations of the hardware at the time, right? It, 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 it's the same in the 1970s, 1960s as it is now. We're, you know, we're always trying to run databases on new hardware and get the best performance we can out of it. So back in the 1970s, though, when they built the first relational databases, database systems, the hardware was a lot different than what we see today. But at a high level, the, the, the basic idea is still the same. Um, and so the problem, though, is like when we start talking about modern systems, the, although the basic idea is still the same, the limitations of that hardware is not exactly the same. So back then in the 1970s, all right, you didn't have machines with a lot of sockets, a lot of, a lot of cores. Right? You had a unit processor. You had a single, single core CPU that could really only execute one thread at a time. The RAM was also severe, severely limited. It was very expensive. Uh, so you were, you were lucky to get you know, a machine that had DRAM but maybe like, of like a megabyte. Certainly now we, we can go into the terabytes on a single box. And because RAM was limited, we had to store the entire database on disk. And so the, the whole architecture of the database system was predicated on you know, retrieving data from disk. And of course, back then, disks were way slower than they were now. And certainly, uh, the sequential access was, was much faster than random access. So you try to design algorithms and data structures that could maximize sequential access. So now, in the modern era, uh, in, you know, in the 2020s, now we have machines that have enough DRAM such that most databases can probably fit entirely in main memory. But there's always going to be the outliers. There's always going to be you know, the Googles and the Facebooks and the Amazons of the world where their, data ba their databases can be in the, the size of petabytes. Um, but for probably 99% of the applications, their database maybe measures in, in gigabytes or a few terabytes. And so again, with, with, that, with that size, you can certainly have a database fit entirely in main memory, whether it's a distributed system or a single node system. So to begin to understand why databases you know, aren't as maybe as large as you think they actually are, you gotta understand that there's this sort of difference between structured and unstructured data or semi-structured data. So structured data sets would be things that we, we normally think about when we think about databases. So you have a well-defined schema, uh, they have attributes, right? And every record has to have those attributes. And so in, in those data sets, they're, they're usually, again, these are typically smaller. Unstructured data sets would be things like video files, uh, sound files, or images, right? These are things where the contents of every single record in, in that data set is going to be different, or there's not even any structure at all, and you, you, know, you can't run queries directly on, on a, a video data. Semi-structured would be things like log files right, that are generated such that they're, they're meant to be human readable, uh, but they're, you know, not, they're not going to have the exact uh, 
same fields for every single log record. Right? You can parse them and, and, and extract those fields, but you know, some log records might have other fields, other, might, other ones might have others. So again, unstructured and semi-structured data sets, these are typically larger. You think of like YouTube, YouTube, you know, the, the MySQL database that, that they use in YouTube, you know, that's going to be a fraction of the size of the total amount of video that they're storing. And the video is all the unstructured stuff. The MySQL Fertis database is the, the, the structured database. So for our purposes here in this class, we're primarily going to focus on the structured data because that's really only, you know, you can kind of do the things that we're talking about here. Right? There's no magic way to do vectorized query execution on video data. What do you have to do? You have to convert that video data into structured data, and then you can run your queries on it. So, right, so, that, so that's going to be the focus for us, ourselves here today. The other thing we need to understand also now is that how are we, uh, and how are we going to get the best performance in, in a database system to run on the structured data? So you may think, all right, well, if my database can, you know, most databases can fit entirely in main memory, can I take a you know, traditional disk-oriented database system as as one as I described last semester in the introduction class, can we just give that, you know, run that on a machine with a large enough, uh, a large enough DRAM and set the bufferable cache size to be big enough uh, such that everything's going to fit in memory? Is, is that going to be enough for us to get the best performance? And the spoiler is going to be no, right? And we need to understand why. So for today's lecture, see how far we can get before we get too cold, is that we're going to first discuss what a disk-oriented database system is, so we can understand, you know, when we start talking about in-memory data systems, how do they avoid all the bottlenecks of or the, the, the slowdown issues of a disk-oriented system? Then we're going to talk about uh, from this we can go a little deeper into concurrency control and see what are the bottlenecks that we have to overcome to get these concurrency protocols to run in in in-memory systems. So the the definition that I always like to use for a disk-oriented database system is one where the, the architecture system of the system is predicated on the assumption that the primary search location of the database, like all the contents of the database, there's records and indexes and materialized views, everything we have to store, is going to be on some kind of non-volatile storage, whether it's a spinning disk hard drive or an SSD. So that means that the database is going to be designed based on this assumption, and therefore all the algorithms, the data structures, and everything that's on inside of it has to be aware that you know at any time we could have to go get something from disk. Now, the database itself will be organized into a, a set of fixed length pages, or sometimes called blocks, and then we're going to use a in-memory bufferable manager to store or cache the pages in memory as we retrieve them from disk. Again, we're assuming a von Neumann architecture, and that means we can't uh, you know, can't operate directly on on data as it exists on disk. You know, that can change in some modern hardware, but for our purposes here, we'll just assume that's not the case. And therefore, this buffer hole manager is really all about how deciding how to move this data back and forth between disk and memory as, as needed. And we want to do this in such a way that we minimize the amount of stalling or the amount of times we have to go out to, go out to disk. So this buffer pool is sort of the key thing that differentiates a disk-oriented database system with an in-memory database system from terms of like the, the architecture. So what's going to happen is we'll have a query that's going to execute in our system, and any time that it has to access a tuple, we have to go find the page that our tuple is, is located in. So the database system will go check to see whether that page that it needs for that query is already in memory. If it is, then we just hand back the pointer to where, where it's located from our buffer pool, and the query can execute. If it's not, then we start needing to do some extra stuff. So first thing we have to go, we have to go do is, well, we got to decide what frame we want to copy our page into our buffer pool. So a frame is just a location in the allocated memory of our buffer pool manager, and we use this term to differentiate it between uh, a page or a block because it's the same frame is going to be used over and over again for different pages. So if there's a free frame, then our job is easy. We just say this is our frame that we're going to put our page in. We go fetch it from disk and copy it in, and we're done. But now if there's no free frames, then we've got to find a page to exist from an existing frame, and that's when things get complicated. So if the page we want to, we want to evict, if it's never modified by a transaction, meaning it's not dirty, then our job is easy. We just go write it out. You know, we, we just go drop it and then reuse the frame. But if it is dirty, then we've got to go now evict it. So we've got to write it out to disk and then flush it, and once that's done, now we can use our frame. 
So again, you can see sort of why this is complicated because you know we're running essentially you know LRU or clock or whatever eviction policy we want to use to decide how to evict frames, and we got to balance that with you know what are other queries or transactions are running at the same time, what pages are dirty, right? This this all gets very complicated. So now, once the page is in memory, then you know we can try to be smart and try to translate quickly any on disk uh, references to to our page to now an on memory address, so that maybe we don't have to go through this whole process of checking the buffer pool manager every single time. But not every, not every system actually does that. So at a high level, what I just talked about looks like this. So for our purposes here, say we're doing a query that's going to look up an index, index that wants to find a, a record, the record's inside a page, and we've got to go fetch it from disk. So to simplify our discussion, we'll just say the index is not, not backed by buffer pool pages. It's just actually sitting in memory. In most systems, that's actually not true. Right, the index pages themselves would be backed by the buffer manager, so we have to go check to see whether those pages are in memory as well and do this entire process, but we'll just keep it simple and say it's entirely memory. So the first thing that we do is go look up in our index to find our record, and what the index will give us is back, give us back is a page ID and a slot number. And then we can use that page ID to look, do a look up in a page table and find the location of the page that we're looking for. So let's say that we're looking for page one, and then we would not find the entry in our page table, or we'd see an entry that says, oh, it's not in memory, it's on disk, and here's where to go find it on disk. So in order to bring it into memory, we have to go pick a existing page to evict. So we have to latch this page table to make sure that nobody else is trying to bring it in at the same time we are, and then we gotta pick a, one of these pages to evict. So let's say we pick page two, but page two is dirty, so now we gotta write it out to disk and flush it, and then once that's done, then we can now use the free frame to copy in page one. And at this point now, we update our page table to say, hey, if you're looking for page one, here's the frame and the buffer will manage to go find it. And then once that's done, we can release our latches and anybody can now access it. So this is a sort of a gross simplification of how this eviction process works, right? Because I'm not showing that, well, if there was an entry for page two and then I need to go update that, now in the page table to say it's not on, in not memory, now it's on disk. But, you know, at a high level, uh, every single database system that's using, using a buffer pool is, is doing something similar. So what's the problem with this? Well, if now we, get, we go back to our example, say let's give our database system a lot of memory, and now everything's going to fit in memory, well, we start going through this entire process to go look up the page table and try to do a translation of like the record ID to its memory location every single time we access a tuple. And we have to take latches and protect things because we don't want us to be accessing a page while and then have another thread try to evict that page. But like I said, if, if we have enough memory, then we're never going to actually write anything off the disk. So pinning these pages or, and latching them is actually not necessary at all. So it's just sort of wasted work. And then running that eviction policy to updating all the internal metrics about how pages are being accessed. That's also wasted work too, because again, nothing's ever going to be evicted. So this sort of answers my straw man question at the beginning that, well, can't we just give a database system a lot of memory and you know, a, a traditionally disk-based data system, a lot of memory, and wouldn't that be enough for, you know, getting the same performance as we would get in, a, in an in-memory system? And the answer is no, because you're doing this all, ex you know, doing this extra work, just go access a single page. Now, this is going to have cascade into other issues as well. So, like in concurrent control, so the you know, traditional disk-based systems, disk-oriented systems, they're designed such that at any time a transaction could touch memory and it's not in disk, and therefore that transaction has to get stalled while the, the disk manager go fetches it. And so while it's stalled, other transactions are, are gonna be able to run on other threads or the same thread so that the system can keep making forward progress even though you know one transaction got stalled because it has to get something from disk. Right? We do this because otherwise, if we can only execute one transaction at a time and we stall anytime we have to get something from disk, then the system is gonna look unresponsive because it's gonna keep stalling and, and you know, every single time you know, we, we have a page miss. So because now we're allowing other transactions to run at the same time, we have to use a concurrency protocol that could be setting locks in our, in our on records or objects in the database to make sure we provide the asset guarantees that you want from transactions, right? Because if now a transaction modifies a page uh, and then it, it, that page gets written out to disk before that transaction can, gets, can commit because some other transaction evicted that page, then we gotta make sure that we keep track of all this extra information and that if we crash and come back, the, uh, the uncommitted transactions changes don't persist. So 
in a disk oriented system, uh, if it's using locking, it's going to maintain this locking information in separate data structures, right? It's an in memory hash table in the lock manager to avoid those, the lock information getting swapped out to disks. So that way, I don't have to g determine whether I can even hold the lock on a tuple to go out the disk and figure out, you know, go fetch that lock information. Everything is always going to be in memory. Other problems we're going to have in an in-memory system is with logging and recovery. So most database systems that use a buffer pool manager are going to be using the steel no force buffer pool manager policies. Um, and this just basically means that all the transactions that a transaction makes, all the, the modifications that a transaction makes, have to get added to a write-ahead log, and th those entries have to get flushed to disk before a transaction is allowed to commit. And then any updates to a dirty page the log records corresponding to those updates have to be written to disk before the dirty page can be written to disk. Right, these are things that we covered in the introduction class last semester. So now in in-memory system, we don't have dirty pages anymore. So maybe we don't need to use the exact same protocol. And then maybe our log entries don't need to store the exact same information as we had in a disk-oriented system. Right? If no dirty pages have to, are ever going to get written to disk, then maybe it doesn't make sense to store the before image or, or the redo information sorry, the undo information of, of, of the transactions modification because that page will never, the dirty page never gets written. So there's a lot of extra stuff we have to do in a disk oriented system that maybe doesn't make sense anymore in a, an in-memory system, like keeping track of the, the, the log sequence numbers, uh, again, again, maintaining the, the undo information because, again, dirty pages don't get written to disk because everything fits in memory. All right, so to get a under better understanding of what this overhead is actually going to be, uh, there's a study that was done uh, at MIT, uh, it's actually 2008, so over 10 years ago now, where they took a old TV database system and they have instrumented it so that they can measure the, the uh, number of instructions that the data system was spending in different parts of the, uh, during query execution while you're running TPCC. And the idea here is, is to break down the system into different components, as I talked about, and just measure, again, how much time we're spending in each of them. So, okay, this is for a database where everything fits in memory. There's no, any, no reads and writes in memory. Nothing gets flushed to disk in that write-ahead log. This is just what is the cost of going access data that's in memory using a disk-oriented architecture. So the first overhead is in the buffer manager. Uh, this is about 34% of the CPU instructions are spent doing updates or lookups into the page table, doing updates, uh, and, and keeping track of all the metadata you have for, for the eviction policy. 14% of the time is spent doing latching, right? This could be for the internal data structures, such as the page table or the lock manager, um, or right? any time that's, you know, it's a, a low-level construct that we need to protect. 16% of the instructions were spent on uh, locking. So this, this particular system uh, was called Shore, and it uses two-phase locking. So this is the overhead of, of updating the lock information for transactions while they run. 12% of the instructions were spent in the log manager. So this is not the cost of writing out the disk. This is the cost of preparing the log records that we're going to write out. And then 16% of the time is spent doing uh, at comparison of, of keys, doing traversals in the B plus tree. Right? This is sort of unavoidable. This is just saying, you know, if I'm trying to find the record that I want through the B plus tree, this is the cost of comparing keys. So this is now going to leave us with a paltry 7% of the CPU instructions we're actually doing what, what they would call real work, like executing the, the logic for transactions, getting back the data, uh, and, and you know, performing, you know, performing the commit operations, things like that. So this is, again, this is showing you that if you take a disk oriented system and you give it all the memory that it wants so that everything, everything fits in memory, you're not going to get potentially the best performance because everything could still... You know, you still have paying the penalty for all this internal architecture that assumes the data is not on disk, and there's all these protection mechanisms for that assumption uh, that are actually not necessary. So my battery on my tablet shut down earlier today when I was recording this outside. It got too cold, and everything, just, the whole thing just shut down. It was like 20 degrees Fahrenheit, which is like negative 7 or so degrees Celsius, so that was kind of weird. So back inside in this weird, I don't know, German gold deprivation chamber thing that they have here. Again, I'm supposed to come in here and think about deep thoughts about databases and somehow become a better programmer like a German. I, I don't know if that's going to work. Um, so let's just continue with the lecture. So where we left off uh, just now was uh, 
we were talking about how the Discordian systems have, um, because they make that assumption that the primary storage location of the database could be on disk, there's all this architecture set up so that uh, at any time, you, could, you know, when you read something, you, you have to go check to see whether it's on disk. And if not, you can install that thread and do other stuff. So now we're going to switch over and talk about an in-memory database system. So this is one where that where the system is going to assume that the primary storage location is going to be of all of all of the database is always going to be permanently in memory. So that means that any single time a transaction or a query goes and reads a tuple, it can assume that that thing is going to be in memory, and therefore it doesn't have to go through all that page table and the and the buffer pool and check anything. It just goes and reads whatever it wants or writes whatever it wants. So. It's not to say that everything we're going to talk about this semester is going to be only targeting in-memory databases, but we'll see how there's going to be certain design decisions that we're going to make that'll make our, our life easier if we, we make this assumption. So this idea of an in-memory database is not new. Um, the first proposed systems go back in, into the 1980s, um, but they're not really you know viable option now, maybe in the last 10 years, because it's gotten to the point where DRAM prices and capacities are such that you know we can store really large databases in memory. Um, so the you know the, there was this initial idea proposed in the 1980s. We'll talk a little bit about that as we go along. Um, but the first commercial in-memory databases literally didn't come out until like the 1990s. Um, the most famous three are probably Times 10, um, which was originally called Smallbase, and then they forked off from HP and became Times 10, and then Oracle bought them uh, probably. Uh, right, 2006 or so. Data Blitz was a system out of, out of Bell Labs at at and in the 1990s. It was originally called Dolly. Um, it was sold for like telecom switches and things like that. I don't think it's still around today, or if it is, it's sort of a, it's obviously in legacy mode. And then Altabase is out of South Korea. Um, it's one of these early again these early in-memory databases, which actually is still around today. And actually, within the last two or three years, they open sourced it, so you can go and check that out on GitHub. So. Even though, again, now the data set is going to be entirely in main memory, um, we're still going to organize data uh, into blocks and pages, just not slotted pages, because we don't, we don't have to worry about indirection within a page itself. And so the system architecture will be slightly different now, because now instead of dealing with these record IDs, we can deal with direct memory pointers. Um, the way we're going to handle fixed length versus variable length data will be slightly different than a than a disk-based system, because again, we don't have slotted pages. And although not many systems have this, but this, some do, um, there is a concern that now, because everything's in memory, any thread can read, or sorry, can write anything in the address space of the process. So to make sure that we don't have, you know, uh, you know error-prone software collaborating our data and causing permanent damage, um, we can use checksums throughout the system with these blocks. To keep track of uh, you know the the status of, of a of a page, and you know detect errors if there's ever problems. Now underneath the covers, the operating system and the hardware is also going to be organizing memory into pages as well. That's not really going to be our concern for most most of this semester. We'll talk a little bit later on in a few more lectures because we need to understand how it's actually going to lay out data so that when we start laying out data, we can align to what the underlying page representation in the OS is, or the hardware is. Um, for our purposes now, we, we can ignore that. So again, let's return back to our high-level example here, where we had a query, wanted to access the tuple, and was going to go, go through an index to look it up. So now in our index, instead of returning back a record ID or a page, page ID and an offset, we're now going to get a block ID and an offset. And this block ID could either be the direct memory address of a fixed length block, or there could be an additional mechanism that allows us to look it up and see, you know, convert that block ID to a to a, a memory location. So the primary storage location of the database again is in memory, or every tuple is in memory, but we're going to organize them in these fixed length records. And so for this, it doesn't matter whether we're assuming a row store or a column store, but the basic idea is the same. And that is we're going to have a set of blocks where we're going to store the fixed length data for a tuple. So anything like an ints, uh, dates, uh, floats, reels, things like that, all that can be stored as, as fixed length um, and fixed length block. And that means that the size of every tuple here is going to be the same. Um, 
And so that says now, if we have this block ID and we convert that to a memory address, when we want to do a lookup to find the tuple within the offset of that block, we just do some simple uh, memory arithmetic to take the size of the tuple, multiply by our offset, and that us tell us where to be jumping memory within a block to go get it. Now to handle very length data, this is going to be much different than what we would do in a uh, disk-based system. So variable length data, we're instead, instead of actually storing the data in line in the fixed length data block, for the most of the time we're going to store a pointer to some other memory location in a variable length data pool where that's a direct access to the, the data that corresponds to the, this attribute within this tuple. And again, the idea here is that we can guarantee that all the tuples in the fixed length data blocks are fixed length, and then for anything that's variable length, we shove that into the, the variable length data block. And again, this is different than the slotted page design you would see in a disk-oriented system because in there, we're trying to reduce the number of, of disk reads. So therefore, we try to pack in all the variable length data for a tuple within, you know, with the tuple itself, with all the fixed length data. Um, that doesn't always happen. If we have to spill over to another page, we can do that. But most of the time, we, we try to make that happen. And in this world, in a memory system, we actually want to store the variable length data separately. So that way, we can do that uh, deterministic lookups to find memory addresses for tuples. All right, some other things that, that are going to be different that we, we kind of talk about quickly with in-memory databases, right? And again, this, these are the things that we're going to talk about throughout the entire semester. Um, the first one is going to be how we're actually going to store indexes, or how we're, what data structures we're going to use for indexes. So when those first in-memory database systems were proposed in the 1980s, the hardware was a lot different than the hardware we know about today, or how the hardware is laid out today. So in particular, back then, the cache and memory access speeds were about the same. But now this is not the case at all, right? CPU caches are way faster than, than main memory access. So back then, people were designing data structures where you, you know, reading from cache was the same as reading in memory. So they, so they would organize a certain way. But now, in the modern era, we don't want to do that. So therefore, we want to use indexes that know that they're dealing with memory and, they're, and they have caches and try to minimize the cache misses when, when you access things. So the spoiler is going to be that a B plus tree is going to turn out to be a uh, the, the best data structure to use for an in-memory database. Even though B plus trees were originally designed for disk-based databases, um, they're actually still really good for in-memory databases as well. So the other major thing, difference, maybe that difference we're going to have with indexes is that in a disk-based system, you would also write log records and write out di pages for the index to disk so that you can recover them after the system restarts. In an in-memory system, we're actually not going to record any log records and not write indexes out to disk for most systems um, because the cost of rebuilding the index after we restart the system is, is going to be super low. Right? So think about this. When the system, and for in-memory database, when, when I restart it, I've got to bring the database entirely back into main memory. And so the cost of reading that, those, the data from, from disk is super expensive, whereas the cost of building the index at, once the data is already in memory is is you know it's, it's cheap because it's just CPU computations. So for this reason, and, and again avoiding the having to log records to the, log updates to records to the index updates to the index at runtime, which is slow us down, we just rebuild the index after after we restart. Again, we'll cover this and explain this in more detail when we talk about indexes. For query processing. Again, now, in the, in the disk warning system, the disk I.O. was always the most expensive thing. So who, who cares what kind of, for the most part, how you computed the data or, you know, the organized, the access of data once it was in memory. So in a disk warning system, or sorry, in-memory system, we are going to care about now the overhead of doing function calls and branches and things like that. So you need to be more careful how we organize the system and do query processing. Sequential scans are also not significantly faster in a in-memory system, so maybe there's certain algorithms and you know join join methods for doing joins and other things that uh, we don't have to worry about making you know, optimizing or maximizing the amount of sequential access because random access will be good enough. Again, we'll, we'll cover this in more detail as we go along. For logging and recovery, I sort of mentioned this already before, but now that everything's in memory, there are no dirty pages we need to flush out the disk. Uh, we can be a bit more conservative or we can end up recording less data than we, than we need, than we normally would need in a disk system if we know that everything's in memory. Um, so standard techniques like group camp will use a batch of logs to amortize the FSync costs. Um, that's 
that's applicable for a disk writing system too. But being being able to use a more lightweight logging scheme is a, a definite advantage for a, a memory system, right? Because again, there's no dirty pages. We don't need to do undos. Anything we write to disk as part of a checkpoint is going to be already from a committed transaction for the most part. All right, so now if the disk I.O. is not the, the slowest resource, then we can change, um, and we change what sort of protocols and methods and algorithms we're using to process queries and transactions in our database system. Now we need to be mindful of the other bottlenecks that are now going to come to the forefront because disk I.O. is no longer in the critical path. So this is essentially what the entire semester is about, how to deal with these other issues when we design database systems. So locking and latching, so concurrent methods and the low-level low primitives to protect that there's data structures. Cache line misses uh, are a big deal because again, memory access versus cache access is, is much more expensive. Chasing pointers, doing jumps to random locations of memory, and that will cause more cache misses, that becomes problematic. Evaluating predicates, do, you know, taking the where clause for, every, for a billion tuples and evaluating it, that's going to be expensive. Moving data uh, or copying data, so data movement would be if I have to move data from one so CPU socket to another, that's expensive. Copying data would be materializing the, the intermediate results or copying data between sockets to pass things around. Those are things we want to avoid. And of course, networking is always a big issue now. Um, you know, this is be primarily between the, the application and the database system and not between different nodes of the same database. Um, it matters for a disk oriented system too, but again, now that disk is gone, this is this is even more problematic in an in, in memory system. So for the rest of this lecture, I want to discuss locking and latching. Um, so we're going to focus on concurrency control here, and this is just mostly to set us up to understand going forward how you know to think about and methods to think about you know what is it that, that makes a database system slow, and uh, you know when we start scaling up more, more CPU cores. What are some of these other bottlenecks and problems that we're going to have? So again, as we covered in the introduction class, concurrent control is essentially the protocol that the data system used that allows it to execute multiple transactions at the same time. And each of these transactions are going to sort of have this illusion that they're executing on the system by itself, by themselves. So they don't have to worry about reading uh, or reading the effects of other transactions running at the same time. I, this is essentially what you would want to achieve in your system because that's it's the easiest way to program your application. Um, but of course, now this is not easy to do. If you start interleaving, tr interleaving the operations between the different transactions, you could violate this ordering. So the concurrent protocol of any database system is going to provide the atomicity and isolation guarantees within this as asset acronym. So f for an in-memory database system, there's this key observation we have to make about how we're going to acquire locks to access tuples. And that is the cost of a transaction acquiring a lock is essentially going to be the same thing as just accessing the data. So what I mean by that is in a disk oriented system, we said that, that all the locks would be stored in memory in some kind of data structure. And they would be and they were separate from the actual tuples. But now if everything's in memory, then the cost of going and accessing the lock table is going to be the same as accessing the tuple. So ideally, I want to be able to do those at the same time so that I'm not paying the, the penalty of doing two memory reads. And this is the core idea that we're going to try, try to install when we do in-memory database system concurrent control. The other important thing to understand, too, is, is in a disk oriented system, the stalls are due to transactions trying to access data that wasn't memory and have to go di out the disk and get them. But now we're not going to have those kind of stalls anymore. Yet, yes, there'll be memory stalls, but those are going to be much, much less than you know disk stall. But the thing we are going to have, or that the earlier systems don't have, is a way more cores. And so now the contention is going to be in the system of many transactions trying to read and write to the same object at the same time, and they're not stalling because there's a disk. They're stalling because they don't, they can't acquire the locks on certain things. So to understand, again, how we're actually going to be able to maintain locking information along with the tuple, uh, we need to understand uh, this sort of basic compare and swap primitive we're going to use to modify things. So we're not going to use mutexes protect tuples. Uh, 
because uh, they would be too slow. Instead, we're going to use these atomic operations called compare and swap. So th I think this is primarily covered in other classes. And so I just want to give you a quick overview of what it is, because th this is going to come up multiple times um, throughout the semester. And it's good to sort of see it once. Um, we're not going to go details of actually how this is implemented in hardware. Just know that this, this concept that actually exists. So compare and swap is an atomic instruction that pretty much every modern CPU will provide you. Uh, it's, not a new, it's not a new concept. I think it goes back to the 1970s. Um, pretty much every Xeon or ARM architecture or Pyro PC will give, give you this now. And the idea is that it's a single instruction that's going to do a lookup in a memory location. And it's going to check to see where that memory location has a certain value that provide it. And then if that value is equal, so the, if the value in that memory location is equal to the value you're checking with, then you're allowed to install a new value to update it. Otherwise, the operation fails. And so in this example here, this underscore underscore sync bool compare swap, this is a this, this is like a C++ or Linux libc um, or Linux uh, C++ operation or intrinsic. Um, different platforms have different things, and I think for the most part in, in modern systems, there's um, there's easier to understand or, or uh, intrinsic functions that can do the same thing. But the idea here is that we're giving it a, giving it a memory address, we're giving it a compare value and a new value. So the current memory address uh, that m points to contains the value 20. So in a single instruction now, we're going to see whether 20 equals 20 in the memory location, and if yes, uh, we'll install we'll install the new value 30. So in this case here, in a single instruction, we look up to see uh, that m equals 20, and it does. So then we can install 30. Right? Otherwise, th this would have failed. So uh, in this example here, uh, the, it, it, the function here returns uh, true-false to say whether it succeeded or not. There's all the different types of, of compare and swap instructions. Sometimes they'll return back the, the, the new value that, that got installed or the old one if it didn't get updated. Some, and then you can change the, you know, the size of the, the memory address that you're looking at, whether it's you know, 32 bits or 64 bits. Right? But again, the basic idea is always the same thing. Within a single instruction, we can do this check. And this is be a core primitive that we're going to use all throughout the semester that allows us to do these kind of lock-free or latch-free operations very efficiently. So we want to talk about quickly um, sort of the two sort of categories or classes of computer protocols that we're going to be working with uh, this semester. And this, again, this is sort of a refresher from what we covered in the introduction class last semester. And so... The first is going to be two-phase locking. So these are pessimistic schemes where the data system is going to assume that transactions are going to conflict, and therefore they have to acquire locks on any objects before they're allowed to access them. Timestamp ordering is an optimistic scheme where you assume conflicts are rare, so you don't require transactions to acquire locks on database objects. And all you do instead is that when the transaction goes to commit, you see whether there, there was a conflict, and then you correct them as needed. So let's go through each of these one by one. Um, showing really high-level examples, and then we'll get into the paper discusses how do you actually implement this on modern systems. So here's a simple example for two-phase locking. We have a transaction T1, and it wants to do a read on A followed by a write on P. So again, under two-phase locking, we have to acquire the locks for any object that we want to read and write. So in this case here, we've got to get the read on the lock on A followed by the lock on B. So this is a really simple example, or simplified example, because I'm, you know, there's only this a simple one type of lock on, on A and B. But in a real system, as we covered last semester, uh, you know, you would have different lock modes. You can have a shared mode to allow multiple transactions to read the same object, an exclusive mode to say that only one transaction can, can lock it, can, can, act, can write it at, at a given time. So in this case here, because it's two-phase locking, the first part of the transaction is called the growing phase, and this is where we're acquiring locks that we're going to need. <laughs> Sorry, that we're going to need during during the execution of the transaction. And then, as soon as we release one lock, now we're in the shrinking phase, um, and we're not allowed to acquire any new locks. Um, but we we can do operations on the on the objects we still hold the locks for. So, in, in a real system, like in if like it's based on SQL. You wouldn't actually have uh, explicit lock and unlock commands. 
These are something the data system does, does for you automatically underneath the covers. So typically, you, you're, you don't release the locks until the transaction actually commits, which is called uh, rigorous two-phase locking. But for our purposes here in this example, we're not doing that. We can, we can unlock A and then, and then do the write on B, and that still follows the, the original two-phase locking protocol. All right, so let's say now we have another transaction, T2 comes along, and it wants to do a write on B followed by a write on A. So say these two transactions are running at the same time on different threads, and therefore they can, they can do these things in, in parallel with each other. So in, in T1, we first get the lock on A. On T2, we can get the lock on B. This is fine, assuming there's no other transaction running at the same time. So, so both these transactions can acquire those locks. And the next step, the transaction T1 does the read on A, which it's allowed to do because it holds the lock on A. Transaction T2 does the write on B, which it's allowed to do because it holds the, the lock on B. But now we get into trouble here because T1 wants to do a lock on B, T2 wants to get a lock on A, but each of these are held by the other transaction, so they have to stall, right? And they, they, they're essentially waiting for the other transaction to give up the lock, so I can go ahead and can make forward progress. But of course, we have a deadlock here, and so now we have to do something to break this, because otherwise the system would, would be locked forever. So there's two ways to do uh, deadlock or handle deadlocks in two-phase locking. The first is to do deadlock detection. This is where you have a separate background thread that's just going to occasionally or periodically wake up, check to see where the transactions are running, um, and if it finds a deadlock, then it uses some kind of heuristic to decide how to kill them. Right? Because say you know, kill the transaction that has that has done the least amount of work, or is the oldest, or holds the most locks. The, the various systems do various things. Or, or different systems do all all different types of uh, deadlock detection algorithms. Deadlock prevention is instead of having a separate thread, you just have a way to make sure that when transaction tries to acquire a lock, if it can't hold it, then it makes a decision about what it should do other than, than just waiting. Um, so for example, if, I, if a transaction tries to hold a lock, acquire a lock, but that lock is being held by somebody else, then it can either kill itself or kill the other transaction and steal its locks, right? Again, we, we just have to make sure we do the operations in the right order so that there's, uh, so that there's, you know, there's no cycle dependencies. All right, so the other type of protocol is uh, called timestamp ordering. Um, again, this is sort of category of systems that are going to use timestamps that are locks to figure out the right order that transactions should be allowed to complete. So uh, the sort of two basic protocols are basic timestamp ordering, which is sort of confusing because it's, it's usually referred to as the timestamp ordering protocol, which is, is in the category of timestamp ordering protocols. But, you know, so I'll call it basic TO just to differentiate it. So the idea here is that we're going to check for conflicts on every read and write, and we're just going to and use timestamps to determine whether there is a conflict, and then we're going to copy tuples um, into a private workspace for each transaction as they read them to ensure if they go back and read the same tuple, they get the same value, right? Because otherwise, you could be reading something that was written in the future, and that shouldn't have happened. Optimistic concurrency control is where, in addition to copying the things you read into your private workspace, oh, sorry. You're also going to co uh, make copies of any tuples you modify, and, and all your writes go into the private workspace. And then when you go to commit, then you do the validation to check to see whether there were, there were any conflicts. And if not, then you can merge all your private workspace changes back into the global database. So again, we'll go through each of these one by one. So uh, say for the basic timestamp ordering protocol, we have a transaction T1. It wants to do a read on A, a write on B, and th there's going to be some kind of stall, and it wants to do a write on A. So when a transaction starts, we have to assign the timestamp because we're going to use that to determine the serial ordering of transactions. So there's different schemes you could use. I could use a hardware clock. I could use a logical counter. I could use a hybrid of the two. But for simplicity, let's just say we use a logical counter and we just update that counter every single time we start a transaction and we assign that new timestamp to, to, the, to, the, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the transaction. So this transaction starts uh, and it's going to be the timestamp 10,001. Now inside the database, for every single record we're storing, we're going to maintain two additional fields. So we'll maintain the read timestamp and the write timestamp. The read timestamp will be the highest timestamp of the last transaction that successfully read this tuple, and the write timestamp will be the last timestamp, the timestamp of the last transaction that wrote to this tuple. And the idea is that these timestamps are always going forward in time. They can never go backward, because that would be violating the, the timestamp ordering of transactions. All right, so our transaction starts, it does a read on A. So the first thing it needs to do 
is check the right timestamp and see whether its timestamp is greater than ours, meaning we, we would be trying to read something in the future that we wouldn't shouldn't be allowed to read. So in this case here, the, the right timestamp for record A is, t is 10,000. Our timestamp is 10,001. So we'll be allowed to read this. So we need to update now the read timestamp to check to see whether its timestamp is, 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 is less than ours. And if it is, then we want to go ahead and update it. So in this case here, we'll update it with 10,001. Now this is telling other transactions that may want to update this, this tuple that there was a transaction at timestamp 10,001 that has read it. So make sure that we don't write something in the past that this transaction missed. So then now we do the write on B. Same thing, we first check to see the right timestamp, see, we have to see whether it's in the future from when, when we're at, and therefore we, we would be overwriting future data with past data, which would be, is not allowed. And then we check the read timestamp to make sure someone didn't read this record in the future, and if we did write to it, they would end up missing it. So in this case here, uh, our timestamp checks out for both of these, both the reads and the writes, so we go ahead and update the write timestamp field. Then I'll say that our transaction has some kind of stall, like it's computing the, the you know the one billionth digit of pi, or it's accessing remote some remote system. For whatever reason, there's a stall, and during this time, another transaction comes along and modifies record A, uh, and now updates the, the right timestamp with ten thousand five. So now we'll see that we have a, we have an issue because now when our transaction wakes up and tries to then write to to, to record A. That timestamp 10,005 is greater than our timestamp 10,001, so we shouldn't be allowed to do this because this would be trying to overwrite a, a logical record that was updated in the future with a physical record of in the past. So in this case here, this would be violating the timestamp ordering, and our transaction has to get killed and aborted, and we roll back any changes. So most systems uh, that are out there don't do the basic timestamp ordering protocol. The more common approach is to do OCC, or Optimistic Concurrent Control. Again, this is confusing because <sighs> timestamp ordering protocols are, are by themselves are optimistic schemes, but there is a protocol specifically called the Optimistic Concurrent Control Protocol Scheme. All right. So the basic idea here is that, like timestamp ordering, <sighs> sorry, it's late. Like timestamp ordering, there uh, we're going to maintain a private workspace, we're going to copy all our red data into it so that we go back and read the same record, we get the same value. We're also going to write all our changes into that private workspace as well. So now when a transaction commits, we have to verify that there's no conflicts, and if not, then we can go ahead and install them to the global database. So OCC is, is an old, old protocol. Actually, most, most concrete protocols, the basic ones are old. Um, this one goes back into 1981 and actually was invented here at Carnegie Mellon by a Professor H.T. Kong. H.T. Kong is no longer here. He's now at, at Harvard, um, and he's not even a database professor. He, he did no networking, but this is sort of like his most famous work is, is actually a database paper. So that's kind of cool that this came out of the computer science department here at CMU. So again, here's a simple transaction. We'll do a read on A, on a write on read on A, write on A, and write on B. So. In our database now, we don't need the read timestamp field for records. We only have to have the write timestamp field. And so now when our transaction starts, unlike in basic timestamp ordering protocol, we're not actually going to assign it a timestamp. Right? We're going to do that later. So anytime we're going to read and write stuff, we're going to make a copy of it in, into a private workspace and set it with the timestamp infinity. So uh, OCC has three phases. Um, so the first one, unfortunately, is called the read phase. So even though we're going to do writes in this, this, for whatever reason, the, this, they call this the read phase of a transaction. If, if I had my choice, I probably would have called this like the run phase or the execute phase. I think that makes more sense. Um, for, for whatever reason, it's called the read phase. So again, we're going to do a read on A here in the read phase. So we're going to have to copy uh, that record in the global database into our private workspace um, so that, again, we can always read this thing over and over again at the same value. So now when we do a write on A, right, we're not going to modify the global database, we're going to modify the one in our private workspace. So we don't have a write timestamp yet, because we haven't been assigned one, so we're just going to set that to infinity in our workspace and then update the value. Same thing on B here, we're going to first copy it from the global database into our private workspace, and then update it with our infinity timestamp and the 
uh, and our new value. So now when a transaction goes to commit, it's not actually going to commit right away. There's now going to be two additional phases, the validate phase and the write phase. And so the validate phase is basically where we're going to look at a private workspace, see what, see what, what records we modified, and go to see whether that would vi whether there's any uh, there's there's either transactions that are still running that have read this data and therefore they didn't see our updates because it was in a private workspace, or there's transactions in the past that have already committed that have uh, modified this and therefore we didn't actually see their changes as well, and therefore we would have a conflict. So that's either you're doing backwards validation or forward validation. Again, we covered that in, in, in the introduction class. It's not really important right now. But the basic idea is, like, is, again, you're making sure that transactions are always committing sort of in the right order. So if we pass the validate phase, there's no conflicts. Then we now enter the write phase, where we uh, now are finally assigned a timestamp. And then we update the global database with our changes that we've made from our private workspace with our, with our new timestamp. And then, and then at this point, the transaction is considered to be done, and it go, goes ahead and commits. So the one important thing to understand about this is that when there's not really any contention, then the optimistic schemes like OCC are actually going to perform better than two-phase locking because we're, you know, since we assume that the conflicts are rare, we're going to spend less time checking for conflicts. Right? We're going to spend less time looking for, for, for conflicts that don't actually exist. It's sort of like in the Discordian system with if everything fits in memory, then we're going to waste time looking, you know, to see whether we have to evict something to make space in our buffer pool manager, right? So it's better off just to optimistically assume everything fits in memory and just jump right to get get what we, get what we need. But the issue is going to be now with high contention. I mean, when we have a lot of transactions trying to trying to read and write to the same records, then all the protocols that I've just talked about are, are essentially going to degenerate down to just being the zero execution of transactions, meaning only one transaction can run at a time. And we're going to waste all this extra, extra, these extra, we're going to spend a lot of time in our protocols doing work that's essentially useless because our transactions are never going to be able to commit. So to better understand the, this issue, this is what this, the paper I had you guys read is about. So this is a study I did with a former student of mine who is now a uh, new data professor at the University of Wisconsin. Um, we did a few years ago where we implemented a testbed system that would allow us to evaluate different concurrent show protocols at extreme levels of parallelism. Um, and so what's kind of interesting about this project is rather than taking like Postgres and MySQL or whatever data system you want and trying to do a bake-off between the two of them, um, we implemented a single system that had a pluggable API that allows us to plop in different uh, concurrent show protocols without making major changes to the rest of the system. And the idea here is that we want to strip it down to just being the bare minimum you need to sort of execute transactions in a database system without all the additional bells and whistles and features that, I, yeah, that a, a full featured system like MySQL Postgres would have. Right? We just focus on what the overhead is of these concurrent protocols. So the idea also too was that we want to run this, you know, this, these systems in a highly parallel environment um, so that it would sort of really expose this, the, what the main bottlenecks are in the implementations of the different protocols in the system you know, in, in a way that you couldn't get maybe running on a machine with like 32 cores or 64 cores, which is sort of the most you can get around this time in 2014 when we wrote this paper. So the system we're going to use for this evaluation is called DBX1000. So this was, again, the system that the, the student wrote um, for this paper. And again, it was written from scratch just to have this pluggable API that allows you to plop, uh, drop in different implementations of these concurrent show protocols. So it's a stripped down system. There's no network access. There's no logging, at least at the time that we wrote this paper. And it didn't support concurrent indexes. It really was just focusing on how fast can you do concurrent show protocols. All the transactions are going to execute with stored procedures, and so that means all the server-side logic in order to execute a transaction is contained on, on the data system itself. So you never have to go back, the, back over the network and ask the application of the client, you know, what should I do next? And so we're going to run this now also in a chip simulator developed by <sighs> at MIT, at MIT um, called Graphite. 
And this was modeling a single socket tile based CPU with a NUCA architecture. So NUCA stands for non-uniform cache access and we contrast that with the NUMA architecture, non-uniform memory access that we're mostly going to be talking about during the semester in like, you know, Intel Xeon chips. So NUCA basically means that the cost of one core accessing the cache of another core is not always going to be the same because it's going to have this tile-based architecture where you have to communicate over this mesh network uh, in order to do, you know, do cache invalidation and do reason writes between different cores. And so some cores are closer to you on the network and therefore you're reading and writing to their memory locations or their caches is uh, much faster than one that's maybe on the completely other side of this network. So I'm not really an architecture person. Um, the reason why we went with this sort of tile-based approach is that when you talk to people that are architecture experts, they said that you know, when you start getting up to like a thousand core count, um, sort of the, the conventional wisdom is that you'd want to use a tile-based architecture like this. Again, the main takeaways we're going to get from the study are not going to be dependent on using a tile-based architecture and are still applicable to the Xeon type systems we'll be talking about for this semester. It's just it's what the hardware was that, that we had at the time to, to model this. So another important thing to understand too is that this CPU simulator runs really, really slow. All right, so it's 10,000 X slower than the wall clock time uh, of, of a you know, system running a bare metal. So that means that there's a bunch of optimizations the student had to do in DBX1000 to get it to run at a reasonable time in the simulator. So if you go look at the code on GitHub, you'll find that there's, there's, a, lot of, um, there's a lot of assembly in the different parts of the system because he had to do that to get it to run run fast and you know get the experiments to finish in time. All right, so the target workload we're going to be using for this paper is going to be YCSB, um, the Yahoo Cloud Serving Benchmark. So the it's basically a key value store workload that's sort of meant to model the sort of the access patterns of a, of web services or, or web-based applications. So in the database, there'll be 2 million tuples, and each tuple is, is 1 kilobyte. So every transaction that we're going to model or run in our system is going to execute uh, queries that are going to read and write 16 different tuples at a time. And we're going to vary their access patterns, the skew in the access patterns, so sometimes there'll be hotspots and sometimes there'll be uniform access. So all the transactions are also going to run a store procedure. Store procedure is running the serializable isolation level. So the six different schemes we're going to compare are based on the, the different type of protocols that I talked about before. So for two-phase locking, there's going to be deadlock detection and then deadlock prevention with no wait and wait and die. And this, this is emblematic of sort of the, some of the, the biggest database systems that, that are out there today. Now on the timestamp ordering side, there's a timestamp ordering, then there's OCC, and then there's a multi-version, uh, there's the original multi-version protocol Present or described in the, like the 1979 paper that originally described MVCC that uses timestamp ordering. Next class, we'll see that you can have different variants of multi-versioning that uses OCC or two-phase locking. But for this one, we, we just went with the sort of the original protocol proposed in the 1970s. And this is emblematic of a, most of the newer systems today, as well as some sort of classic uh, database systems that use multi-versioning. All right, so for the first experiment here, uh, this is sort of the, the sort of the baseline performance of these different protocols in a read-only workload. So what you're seeing is that along the x-axis, as we scale up the number of cores, uh, we're adding more uh, more concurrent transactions running at the same time. So every single time we add a new core, that's going to have a, an additional transaction running that's you know running part, that's executing part of the workload. So with 200 cores, there's 200 concurrent transactions running at the same time. So this is a read-only workload with uniform memory access uh, or, or tuple access. So again, this is the best that these different protocols can do because there's, you know, there's zero contention. So the first thing we see is that the deadlock detection and the no wait protocols actually can almost scale linearly and, and are performing the best, right? Because these protocols are so simple, there's no deadlocks and therefore the overhead of transactions and executing is, is minimal. Next thing you see is that there's this knee here um, at 800 cores, where wait and die and MVCC start start to dip down, and this is due to the overhead of allocating unique timestamps for transactions as as they're running. Right when you're running with a million, million transactions, that they're running at the same time, or uh, 
when you're running 8 million transactions a second, for this tile-based architecture, the timestamp allocation and coordinating that across all different threads becomes a bottleneck. And lastly, you see that OCC here actually does the worst. Right? So this is the combination of, of having to copy the private workspace for every single transaction and copy that back into the system. That actually becomes a big bottleneck. So next we see here is a write-intensive workload where you now, now I have transactions actually updating the database. And this is on a medium contention workload where 60% of the transactions are going to try to access a hotspot of 20% of the database. So the first thing you're going to see is that deadlock detection is actually now the worst protocol used for this, this environment. You know, in the last slide I showed you it was actually the best, but now when you have high content, a higher amount of contention, there is deadlocks. Uh, there's more deadlocks in the system, and therefore it takes longer for the deadlock detection thread to come around and, and break these deadlocks. So you essentially have threads stalling and waiting for that deadlock detection thread to come through and clean things up, and that, that hurts performance. Next, you see that the uh, no wait and wait die actually do the best, right, and this is because these protocols are so simple. So what's happening is that the, you know, yes, there, there's anytime there's a conflict, um, and there, there would be a deadlock, these protocols immediately just kill the transaction and restart them. So you don't spend any wasted time trying to figure out, you know, should, should I wait or, you know, or hoping the other transaction is going to give up a slot. You make some action right away. No wait's the simplest one, right? It basically says, I tried to acquire my trans block, I couldn't get it, I immediately kill myself. And again, because we're store procedures, there's no overhead of restarting the transaction in, in the in memory environment. It's super fast. All right, and in the middle here, you see the three timestamp ordering protocols, basic TO, MVCC, and OCC. They're roughly all doing about the same. OCC is doing slower, again, because there's extra overhead of copying things to the work, you know, in and out of the workspace over and over again. Um, but, you know, they're, they're roughly about the same. So now we get to the, this final graph here, which is the most important one in the paper. Um, and this is where we're running a writing test of workload where 90% of the transactions are updating 10% of the database. So now you see that all the protocols basically crash down to zero when we get up to a, a thousand cores. Right? There's, there's n none of these protocols are actually scaling. So, and again, the reason is that there's all this overhead of transactions having to check for conflicts or copy things around, and there's just so many conflicts that you just can't make any forward, you know, forward progress and get things completed. So one interesting thing is that you see no wait is kind of going along doing okay relative to the other protocols until 800 threads and then it crashes down to zero. So it's not doing that great compared to the previous slides. Like it's only executing 200,000 transactions a second, whereas the other slides I was showing you can do millions of transactions a second. Um, but again, it's it's doing okay because it's, it's protocol is so simple that Yes, there's you know when it, when the system identifies that there's going to be a deadlock, it kills the transaction immediately and restarts it. Uh, whereas the other ones, uh, and the cost of doing that is super cheap relative to the other ones. Of course, now at a thousand cores, doing that just you're just aborting transactions so much that you just can't get any work done. The other interesting thing to point out is that OCC is actually the worst over here when you have a small number of cores. But on the other side, it's actually doing the best. And again, this is what it, because it's basically degenerating down to doing serial execution of, of transactions. Uh, so the way the protocol works is that when you enter the validation phase, you can guarantee that one transaction is in that validation phase and therefore one is always be allowed to actually commit. So when you're essentially running here at a thousand threads or a thousand cores, is Run, the same thing as you're running on one core. So at least one transaction is going to always be guaranteed to commit. And that's why it gets roughly the same performance as it gets on the other side of the graph. Right, but the main takeaway again is that over here at 1,000 cores, everything's just doing bad. Um, and roughly, it's gotten a little bit better since 2014 when we wrote this paper. Um, but this is roughly where we are actually today in modern systems in terms of you know, running on a single box with like, you know, 64... 32 or 64 cores. So we really haven't hit in the danger zone in, in a modern system of, of having high contention um, in, you know, with a really large number of core counts on a single box. We're just sort of not there yet. But this, this, this graph basically shows you that existing methods that we use out today aren't, aren't going to be scalable. And so real quickly, where are we actually spending our time? 
So this is a breakdown of the different protocols uh, while they execute transactions. And you see that in the case of no wait, it's spending a large percent of its time just aborting transactions. Because as soon as it finds a conflict, it says, this, this is bad, and just restarts it. Whereas the other protocols uh, are spending time waiting to try to acquire locks or try to acquire timestamps or waiting for the deadlock detection thread. Again, that's all just sort of wasted work. All right, so let's quickly talk about some of the, the bottlenecks we identified in this paper um, and sort of some potential solutions we can to get around them. And the idea here is to sort of understand these issues at a high level so that, again, when we start talking about uh, MVCC in more detail in the next class, you, 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 in the back of your mind, you should be thinking about, oh, well, this is how they would, we would handle this, or this is how this could be a problem when we hit larger core accounts than what we actually have today. So lock thrashing, timestamp allocation, memory allocations, we'll go through each of these one by one. So lock thrashing is a phenomenon that you would have in a two-phase locking system, where the if a transaction ends up waiting longer to acquire locks, then this causes other transactions waiting behind it to end up waiting longer to acquire the locks that the first transaction is holding. And therefore, that causes other transactions behind that, you know, sort of second path of transactions to wait even longer. So it's this convoy effect where it causes one transaction to wait longer, it causes everybody else to wait longer, and then that uh, gets exacerbated as you add more transactions. So one way we can actually measure this in our system um, is by removing all the overhead of doing any deadlock prevention or deadlock detection and just having transactions just do nothing but acquire locks and just wait. And so in this case here, the way we can do this is that we're going to force transactions to acquire locks always in some kind of primary key order. Just think of like we're holding, you know, we have a lock 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and we have to acquire them in that sort of lexicographical order. So in this environment, deadlocks are possible, so we'll never have any uh, stalls due to deadlocks. It's just, just the stalls waiting to acquire these locks. And so if you run that experiment on the system, you, would, you get a graph like this. So the theta variable here is representing the amount of skew in the workload, right? Are more transactions trying to access a small number of tuples? So the most extreme case is, is theta 0.8, and theta 0 means that there's, there's no contention. So what you see is are these nice uh, curves, these knee bends where the lock thrashing comes into play, and now transactions are end up waiting longer and longer to acquire locks when there's more, more contention, right? And at some point, you know, this grab just keeps going down, these lines keep going down, you don't recover from this thrashing effect. What I really like about this experiment is because is that it shows uh, this graph actually looks exactly like any sort of textbook that shows you or describes lock thrashing, right? Like, this is sort of one example of a textbook, uh, but they always have this sort of theoretical diagram of, of like, oh, here's the effect of lock thrashing, but, you know, in this case here, our graph matches exactly what you would expect to see according according to um, according to the theory, which is kind of nice. All right, for timestamp allocation, this is not necessarily going to be a, a big issue for us in our system. Uh, we're going to get by with doing either batch addition or atomic addition, um, which is an, another variant of compare and swap. But it's basically saying that in a really large number of core counts, uh, having a transaction that have to all acquire unique timestamps that actually could be a big bottleneck. So the mutex is always just going to be bad. We can avoid that as much as possible. Atomic add, bash add, these are just compare and swap methods. And then for these particular CPUs, uh, some CPUs like Intel, uh, they can have a hardware clock where you can get through a single instruction. But this is not clear whether Intel is actually going to keep this around. Um, and that's not something we, we potentially would want to rely on. And then a hardware counter approach was something that was a th something that the, the student came up with and added to the, the graphite simulation system. This is not something that we would have you know, that exists today. And so this graph is just showing you that the, when does these bottlenecks come into play for running these different uh, time scheme allocation schemes. And again, the batch atomic one is probably going to be good enough for what we need, right? But we're talking, you know, trying to allocate 100 million timestamps per second. That's more than we'll, we'll ever need. All right, the memory allocation stuff, um, the main issue here is that since we have to now copy things um, into private workspaces for some, some protocols or you know copy tuples to make sure we have repeatable reads in, in private workspaces, um, that copying can be expensive. 
And so if we use the default libc malloc, that's going to always be super slow and we never want to use it. So we're not going to discuss different memory allocators too much this semester, other than to say we don't want to use the default malloc. Well, we end up using JE malloc or TC malloc or these other malloc protocols that we, or libraries that are out there. All right, so again, I realize it's kind of weird for having me give the rest of this lecture in this, this gold-plated chamber thing, um, but I just want to get this out there so that we can start talking about MVCC in more detail on, on Wednesday when I come back, to, come back to campus. So the main takeaway I want you to get from this lecture is that the design of an in-memory database system is going to be much different than a disk writing system. Conceptually, it's the same, right? You execute queries, there are indexes, we'll run transactions, but the implementation of the, of the components of these systems are going to be much different. And the good news also, too, is that in-memory databases are not considered to be super bizarre uh, anymore. F when I first started grad school, maybe uh, over 10 years ago now, but like 2007, 2006, they were considered uh, sort of an exotic system. But nowadays, uh, especially with you know, systems like Redis, um, they, they become more common. And people become more comfortable with the idea of having in-memory only systems. The one thing, though, I will say is that in recent years, it seems like the DRAM prices and capacities have stalled compared to the gains we've seen in SSDs. So whereas before I was pretty bullish about, oh, well, in-memory databases are going to take over the world, of course, why would you ever want to use a disk warning system? Um, I, th I don't think that's actually true. Um, and I think that it's worth looking to see what we can do to bring back SSDs in a database system without actually having to slow it down and bring in all the overhead of, of a disk-oriented architecture. So we'll talk about a little bit at the, at the end of the semester, but it's, that's something in the back of my mind. Uh, I think it'll come up a couple of times during the semester. Okay. All right. So just to finish up, uh, this is it for today. I'll be flying back uh, this Friday, and I'll be on campus on Tuesday next week, and we'll have the recitation for. Uh, discussing the, the architecture of the system. And then on Wednesday's class next week, we'll, we will start discussing multi-version concurrent control. Because again, this is the, the, the dominant method or uh, protocol that everyone uses, but it's more than just concurrent protocol. It's going to sort of encompass all different aspects of the database system. So we'll, we'll start understanding that a bit more detail. Okay? So that's it for today. I'm going to go hang out with the Germans a bit more, um, and then I'll see everyone uh, next week in class. All right. Take care. See ya. Bank it in the side pocket. What is this? Hey, yo, hey, yo. What? Took a sip and had to spit Cause I ain't with that beer called the O.E. Cause I'm O.G. Ice Cube down with the S.T.I. You looked and it was gone Grabbed me a 40 just to get my buzz on Cause I needed just a little more kick Hooked like a fish after just one sip yo. Put it to my lips and ripped the top off A ball just dropped off Cause ain't eyes hopped off And my hood won't be the same After Ice Cube take a say I to the brain yeah.